Uh, good morning. This is lecture 24C, It'll be the last lecture for this week. Uh, I think I saw everyone got the midterm uh, multiple choice part done. I haven't checked the essay part, written part, but uh, I'll look at that. Good job of getting all the multiple choice done. Make sure you've got tw chapter 23 and 24 reaction quizzes done or getting them chapter 24. Chapter 23 should all be done. Chapter 24, make sure you get that done. Um, this coming week and the chapter 24 quiz will be posted Friday. Hope all of you are staying dry. Uh, the weather has turned better as far as the weather, but the, the water levels keep rising. So hopefully you're all staying dry. Um, but anyway, the freedom movement number three. So we started talking about civil rights a little bit yesterday, the start of it. The defining case of the 50s is the Brown case. Marshall, uh, Thurgood Marshall launched a frontal assault and segregation of shelf. Uh, required remarkable courage. People were attacked and homes destroyed during this period. There were five cases that were going to be pulled into one. That's where the brown alphabetical is where the name comes from. From states and District of Columbia were combined in 52. When the cases are united, they are listed alphabetically, and the first case gives the entire decision's name, thus Brown versus Board. So Oliver Brown went to court because his daughter, a third grader, was forced to walk across dangerous railroad tracks morning, each morning rather than be allowed to attend a school nearby. Thus, this formed the basis for the Brown versus Board of Education. First, Topeka. Marshall instituted segregation was inherently unequal because it is, uh, stigmatized the one group of citizens to be unfit or to associate with others. The new Chief Justice, Earl Warren, who had been the uh, uh, governor of California, managed to create unanimity on a divided court. On May 17, 1954, they read the decision. He read the decision aloud himself. In the field of education, doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal, he stated. The decision not order immediate implementation, but instead call for hearings as to how to dismantle segregated schools. So, what this essentially does is set in motion desegregating schools. Now, followed by the Brown case, the Brown case was a huge win, it is going to be the Montgomery bo bo bus boycott. Brown did not cause the modern civil rights minute, but gave it a legal power. Mass action against Jim, Roco Jim Crow soon reappeared. December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a white bus. She was arrested. Uh, but it sparked a year-long bus boycott in Montgomery. This was the beginning of the mass phase of the civil rights movement in the South. And thus, though the Brown versus Board does not directly start, it helps unify blacks so that we can succeed in the courts. In November of 56, the Supreme Court ruled segregation of public transportation unconstitutional well. So this is going to be a ripple effect now. The day bake of freedom. The bus boycott gained the support of northern liberals and focused unprecedented and unwelcome international attention. Marked the emergence of the 26-year-old Martin Luther King Jr., a pastor in Montgomery, to uh, international fame. King stated, we, the disheartened of this land who have been oppressed for so long, are tired of going through a long night of captivity, and now we are reaching out for daybreak of freedom and equality. So, Rosa Parks, very famous, obviously, by not giving up her seat. Uh, and what was go the television is going to play a major role in the civil rights movement, especially in the 60s, as international countries are going to see, yes, America is supposed to be this arsenal of democracy, this great place of freedom, but they're going to see blacks blasted with hoses, uh, beaten and hit by police officers in the South, and it's going to cause a ripple effect around the world, and we're going to take a hit for our standing in the 60s. Uh, but some people didn't care, especially Southerners who feel, felt, felt that blacks were inferior at all levels. Now, uh, the leadership of King. King had great oratory, best known for his I Have a Dream speech in 1963 in Washington, D.C. He studied the writings of Henry David Thoreau um, and Gandhi on peaceful civil disobedience. His philosophy of struggle in which evil must be met with good, hate with Christian love, and violence of peaceful demands for change was very, very successful. Though he got calls to be more violent, he maintained the course. And that was the most effective way. Even Malcolm X, who was radical initially, became peacefully minded after his pilgrimage to Mecca, and he realized peace, peaceful protest, is far more effective than violence and rioting itself. Now, massive resistance. This took on the leader. He took on the leadership of forming the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, a coalition of black ministers and civil rights activists, to press for desegregation. Realized that changes would not happen without Washington's intervention. South's refusal to accept Brown uh, was part of the problem. Uh, the Southern Manifesto, denouncing the Brown decision as a clear abuse of judicial power. Uh, so they're basically the Southern Manifesto says where they're going to reject, all out reject the Brown case. Called for resistance to forced integration. Schools were closed and funds given for whites to attend private institutions. Uh, so essentially the South is going to straight up reject all of the court. When was the uh, that giant riot in like Chicago? Like where they... That was after World War One, oh. on the beach incident. 
No, like the one, or it could have actually been around this time. The one where they like ransacked all the shops and burned all those cars and the roads and all that. I'm not for sure on that one. There was Detroit riots in the 40s. Or yeah. Well, it wasn't maybe Chicago, but it was like they broke all. I'm not for sure on which one specific, but there's a series of different riots throughout history. I don't know. I'd have to look at it. That's a good point. But how come, like, back in the day, Martin Luther King was, like, teaching them to riot peacefully, and people nowadays don't get that? Uh, because translation. People don't want to... People don't remember history exactly, and two, people think that violence will lead to better actions. Some people don't actually read history mm -hmm. or remember history and realize that peaceful actions are far better um, it's just our culture in general now is is, is uh, very um, violent. Right. Now, Eisenhower and civil rights. Eisenhower failed to prove, provide moral leadership on this. He called for Americans to abide by the law, but he made it clear he found it all distasteful. Well, he did not like rioting. He didn't like protest. He, being that grandfather figure in military, he liked law and order. So this was very distasteful for him across the board. Though in 57, he did use federal troops to escort and protect nine black students who were denied access to Little Rock's Central High School. So he does take a step there and sets a precedent for future presidents to use military action to end segregation. One of the worst names or unique names for a governor, Gov Governor Orville Fabius, used the National Guard to block the school. Showed that the federal government will respond to violation of court orders and the federal government came in with the U.S. military and moved aside the National Guard. So he used the National Guard to block the school, but then Eisenhower sent federal troops in, which outrank National Guard troops, and said, you will follow the law. Slow rate of change was an embarrassment of the U.S. diplomats across the world. As I said, this is going to be seen on television. This is going to be broadcast worldwide. The Little Rock Nine are, are trailblazers, but we have to use the military, the federal military, to allow them to go to school and protect them for a period. It's not really until Kennedy and Johnson is there actually a lot more progress made, but even then, um, there's a lot of feuding amongst the political leaders of this country. Now, Kennedy and Nixon. President campaign of 60 turned to be one of the closest in American history, Nixon versus Kennedy. Nixon was Eisenhower's vice president. Kennedy was a Democrat uh, from the Kennedy family. Um, JFK was, uh, he was a charisma, he was a pretty boy. I had a lot of redeeming qualities that people uh, liked about him. Tolerance prompted by World War II and weakened traditional anti-Catholicism, so he's a World War II vet. People now are embracing Catholics. He's the only uh, president ever to be elected that was a Roman Catholic. They were both, Nixon and Kennedy, were both ardent cold warriors. Kennedy warned that Republicans had allowed a missile gap to develop once the Soviets had achieved technology and military security over the United States. It was a direct lie. But Americans, Cold War, we got to have every step over the Soviets we can. A very smart lie uh, that helped peel to many. The style and mission of Kennedy's wife, Jacqueline, reinforced the oppression of a youthful, vigorous president. Uh, but really the biggest thing that Kennedy got over Nixon was the first ever televised presidential debate in which he utterly owned Nixon. Kennedy was a good-looking man. He came on television, makeup, the lights made him look good. Nixon was not near as attractive. The makeup did not go well on his face. He was sweating, and so he looked really kind of on television. Kennedy asked, eked out a narrow victory in the end of the election, and some would say that dead people voted. That's been a very, a lot of, if you look at the actual vote vote, it's very close. Um, you look at the two. Uh, Nixon does become president later in 68, uh, but you can see Kennedy's got that charm, that smile, he got a good, he had that, that twangy voice that people were drawn to, that Boston accent, you know, the Massachusetts accent. You walk in the room, people are going to notice Jack, right? They didn't call him, you know, by any, it was, Jack was what he was referred to, right? It wasn't his name, it was John F. Kennedy, right? But call, people called him Jack, right? He's the people's president. People, like, look at him. He looks presidential, right? Looks like a Ken doll. He has a large nose. He actually did a poll, and I think I've alluded to this in a lot of my classes. People elect good-looking people often. If you have an ugly person versus a good-looking person, I'm not trying to be stereotypical or bad. Most of the time, good-looking people win. So, 
Election is super close. If you actually look, it's 50-50 on the, the popular vote. 49.7 to 49.6, less than 100,000 votes. Electoral is a little bit bigger. Um, Nixon only got two, 219 to Kennedy's 303. But popular vote, this is right down the middle. And you notice on this map, uh, if you're looking at this map far as the election results, and I really like these maps, you see independent. There was an independent person who ran. Part of Alabama, all of Mississippi, and a little bit of Oklahoma voted for independent burden. I believe he was a segregationist. Uh, you're going to see in 68, 64 and 68 uh, a segregationist party emerge that was under Henry Wallace. And he was super racist, super I don't want segregation to end, uh, the old mindset of the South. Uh, but we'll look at that later. But you can see this super close election. So the 50s, the end of the 50s, election of 1960, continuing here though, as we end the 50s. President campaign, presidential campaign of uh, Eisenhower delivered a televised farewell address, well liked. So obviously the 60 election's close. He obviously endorsed Nixon. Um, but at the end of the day, Nixon loses this election, right? Military industrial complex, he said, was the conjunction of immense military establishment. Basically now we're a big charge of our military, our, our federal budget goes to the military, but we can't really reduce it because it would be loss of thousands of millions of jobs across the country. Our bases are interrelated with the local economies. So we have this industrial complex with the military services, the jobs, et cetera, all intertwined. He did warn of the missile gap myth. He said it's not true, and he was right. And But few shared Ike's fears of the future um, and what it would entail. Millions of cars were spewing toxic lead and addictive to make or an additive to make gasoline more efficient into the atmosphere. Uh, Los Angeles became synonymous with smog. Chemical insecticides were poisoning farm workers, customers in the water supply that will become fruit in the 60s and 70s. And then housewives were rebelling against their 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 old traditions. So as the 50s comes to a gap, you're going to start to see people challenging the status quo. That being said. Um, as we get into chapter 25, which is the Civil Rights Revolution, the Kennedy years, uh, going into the Johnson and leading up to Vietnam, a lot of things are going to get very intense, um, and they're going to be dramatic. Um, so the 50s was kind of that good feeling, things are going well for the most part, we still fear the Soviets, but overall, things are stable. That's going to change drastically moving into the 60s.